Wow, if you have your second testaments, I invite you to the book of Acts. We'll be in chapter 2 in just a moment. You know, several of you have approached me in the hallways even during the week, Monday through Saturday, and you've been uh, very complimentary of this particular series. Uh, comments like, I've been waiting for this for a long time, or man, I wish you wouldn't quit. I wish you'd keep going. That one I really appreciate. Uh, thank you, even when the, the Cowboys play. Um, thank you. Um, but, but I just want to put that in some context. I think the reason why discipleship matters so much is that churches don't talk near enough about this. We like to talk about other things, but if you really look at the core of who we ought to be, it's disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus. The very word disciple means that we are trying to learn something from someone. And that someone is a crucified Messiah that took 12 disciples and changed the face of the world forever. Have you thought about that? 13 people are the reason why we sit here some 2,000 years later. They changed the world. And I think God longs to do the same thing through us, not just because we gather as the church and sit here as the church, but rather we are sent as the church into the world, and we come here to meet in what we have called in the last few weeks the airport, not because this is a destination, but because this is where we come in order to be sent back out into the world. So for those of you that teach, who parent, who do things that I don't understand with computers, day laborers, whatever you do, you are a minister of the Word of God because you are a disciple. And that's exciting because we're trying to shift our focus here at the Highland Oaks Church. You remember this image from a few weeks ago, this chair that I brought out? There's three chairs that I think are significant as we talk about this story of Jesus. And we witnessed the chairs this morning, right? Where you are claiming to be something that you were to now something that you are. But this third chair is where disciples sit or should sit. It's this chair of becoming, this chair of growing, of deepening, of maturing in Christ. That's who we seek to be here at the Highland Oaks Church. So are you ready? Let's go. Acts chapter 2. Very familiar verse to those of us that have been born and bred and babies here in the churches of Christ. We like this text. Let's try to discover what it means together. The word of God for the people of God from Acts, the second chapter. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were becoming, being saved. Oh God, give us grateful hearts and pour into us a sense of discernment, a deep awareness that we are in the chair of becoming, seeking to become more like you. And Jesus, would you show us again what it's like to do life together? Holy Spirit, we believe you're an active, mysterious presence in our life. So would you equip us to do the things we cannot do on our own? Oh God, I pray for the gift of imagination that we may dare to imagine what it might look like if you were king and our lives were given completely to you. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. So this entire week, I've been trying to find a, a quiet place to study. 
And it's been hard to get away from this image. Um, he's probably the most popular man in the world. He's decided to make his landing here in the United States. Uh, he, he would be the leader of, of millions of followers. And it's striking that thousands of people would enter into a lottery for tickets, not to a football game, not to a concert, but to see someone that grew up as, in some would say, a, a poor fella from Argentina that fell in love with Jesus and began to just understand how to love poor people. And regardless of what you might think of the Catholic Church, you cannot deny this man's ability to attract thousands of people. My question is this. As I'm watching the thousands of people flock to the streets of New York, I'm just overcome with, with a particular question. Is anyone going to change because they've seen this man? Is anyone going to change. It's the same question that we ask in the book of Acts. There are thousands of people listening to Peter declare triumphantly a story. I mean, it's right there at the end of Acts chapter 2. With many other words, he warned them. He pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized in about three thousand were added to their number that day. That's a lot of people listening to a particular story, an invitation for a way to live, to pattern your life. Thousands of people. My question for the text is the same question for this man. Does anything change? And what's amazing is, is we get to read how the church changed. Because you can't come to Christ and walk away the same. Something has to change. And what I'd like to suggest is the conversion from something led to a community of someone. Conversion leads to community. Did you pick up on the way Luke tells this story? Listen to the words. They, everyone, all, together, in common, anyone. It's all about a community of people. And if you think about it, God has always worked through a people. He may have called a person, but God always calls that person to form a people. Think about Abraham. Genesis 12, that significant text where God comes to Abram in a new way and says, I'm going to pursue the entire world. I'm going to make an initiative to bless through you in order to form a people. And you know as well as I do, the Jewish people could not divorce themselves from the notion that they belonged to something greater than themselves. God has always worked and desires to work with a people, not just a collection of individuals. And that's hard. Have you paid attention to the language of our Sundays? Not just this Sunday, but our Sundays in general. Because even our language in church happens to be very individual language. Think about it. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. There's nothing wrong with a personal relationship with Jesus as long as you understand that the personal leads to something greater than yourself. We live in a world that have personal relationships with their cell phones. Amen? I was eating in a restaurant last week, saw a family of seven people. Didn't have one word to say to each other. You know why? Right here. The whole time. They had personal relationships, but there was no one another relationships at all. Even our words and our hymns and our songs. I will call upon the Lord. He leadeth me. And I like those songs. But if we're not careful, that vocabulary can translate into our behavior. And we'll forget that the I songs have everything to do with moving us into we moments. I love that hymn. I love that hymn. I then shall live. But did you catch why 
I then shall live so I can live as a part of a whole. This is not about you in your personal relationship. It is about we. And moving from what is yours to what is ours. And that ought to matter. They devoted themselves to fellowship, breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders. And I love this next part. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions. They continued to meet together. They ate in one another's homes. Do you remember hearing this as a kid? For those of you who grew up in church, I read this passage for the first time with some seriousness when I was in high school, and I thought, this is what church looks like done right. This is about people getting into each other's lives, at their homes, and then someone told me when I was in college, that's what communion ought to look like. I, I thought, really? Communion ought to look like this, this space where we get into one another's lives? And I'd never thought about communion that way. You know why? Because communion for me was always my personal time to focus on my personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've even been a part of conversations, even in the past few weeks. You know, that that communion we do, man, it is so loud, I can't focus on anything. Or that communion we do, I mean, good night. If people just shut up, I might be able to think about Jesus. And I'm thinking, the very word communion is root word for community. And even if you look in the original language, it has everything to do with fellowship, with sharing, with breaking bread together. We shouldn't be afraid of the noise of communion. We should embrace it. Why? Because that ought to signify that we are about us, not about you as an individual. And man, that's hard. Because we live in a world where we like to give our individual orders. You ever been to a restaurant like this? It's family style. That's kind of annoying, don't you think? Because when I go to a restaurant, I want to hold a menu and order exactly what I want. And that gets complicated when you're with a large group of people because everybody has individual preferences, which is fine if you go to a restaurant, but it's not fine if you come to a church because that's not the image I get here in Acts chapter 2. It's family style. It's taking what someone else has brought and putting some on your plate and giving it to them so they can have what you've brought and taking what they've brought and putting it on your plate. It's this shared life together, which is why I love this language of moving from attendance to intendance. I heard a preacher use this several months ago and he made up this word, but I'm going to steal it anyway. Intendance. We're not about attending a church. We're about intending to be the church. And when we are together, it's more than just showing up and attending something, but rather we are intending to be together. We're moving from, yeah, we probably ought to go to church, to we have to go to church. Why? Because this is where I find my people. This is where I find my identity. This is where I root who I am. I am a part of a much larger story. Conversion to Christ always leads to a community of Christ. The story changes you. And it moves you from seeing yourself as an individual to seeing yourself as an individual that belongs to something much larger. You know what college football team is the most annoying college football team on the planet? No, it's not Notre Dame. I could go on with examples, but let me tell you which one is annoying to preachers. It's those stinking Aggies. Because every time I'm at a wedding, even at funerals, and you say Aggies, you hear what? Thank you. I mean, it's just annoying. Would you quit? I mean, you can't say anything. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And I'm thinking, what is all this whooping about? I've never been to Aggie land. I'm from Tennessee where we run around in overalls without shoes. But anyway, it's... 
It strikes me that the Aggies know without a shadow of a doubt that their experience at a university has bound them in a way that they wouldn't have gotten anywhere else. And I think to myself, why aren't Christians more like them? Why can't we walk away and when we see each other, we think, yes, they're on my side. They're on my team. If I need a job, I'm going to call them. If I need help, I know who to stick my hand out to. We can learn something from these communities of people that are deeply devoted to each other. Church should be leading the way rather than trying to catch up. This is what the cross does. It doesn't just save you from your sin and put you into a personal relationship with God. It saves you from our sin. It puts us into relationship with one another. And it's so clear that Luke is telling this story by no accident that conversion leads to community. So let's unpack this text. I want to give you two simple principles. I usually don't tell you how many principles I have because you start looking at the page and your clock and you're like, oh good, now one's over, now two, good, we can go eat. Look, I know how you think, but just follow along with me, okay? In tendance of the earliest disciples is only as good as their intendance to follow Jesus. It may sound simple, but their desire, their devotion to be together is only as strong as their devotion to Christ. Listen to what Luke says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. If you go to some other churches, that's the four marks of the church. And man, let's do a four-week series on those things. I like that idea, but where did the church learn this? Do you think they just woke up one day and said, you know, we probably ought to start listening to people teach, break bread, and yeah, probably ought to pray too. I'd like to suggest that they learned this from Christ. Christ modeled how to be community, and their devotion depended on it. Where would the disciples be without the teaching of Jesus? Where would the disciples be without the fellowship of one another? Where would the disciples be without breaking bread? Where would the disciples be without prayer? They would be absolutely, utterly alone. And I think it's no coincidence at all that Jesus could have saved the world by himself on his own. Why? Because he's Jesus. But because he's Jesus, he chose to form a small community around himself. I noticed something in the first half of Acts in Luke chapter 8. And you'll remember that Acts is the second half of this book. We, we kind of skim over this passage, but I find it significant. Luke chapter 8. After this, Jesus traveled about from town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus is teaching, but listen to what comes next. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, from whom seven daughters had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chutza, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. And a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus, town after town. Why would Luke include that little tidbit? I think Luke is trying to tell us something. That if Jesus is going to call us to community, he's modeling community as he lived himself. Follow along with me. Jesus taught hundreds, maybe thousands of people. And yet, he also gathered crowds around him for teaching. But when Jesus wanted to share life, he picked 12. There, there was no expectation for the crowds of people just to figure things out on their own, but rather he was modeling the small group ministry as he ministered. Twelve people. We could go even further. And he really took three to the garden with him. So out of those twelve was an even deeper layer. But the early church as they met in one another's homes, as they broke bread together, as they gave to anyone as they had need, that came from Jesus. Jesus modeled community, and we ought to pay attention to it. 
The other thing that I want to just highlight that struck me about this particular passage this week in Acts is, is this notion that every day they met together and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. I don't think the earliest church could conceive being the church without one another. In other words, I think if you were to walk up to Paul and say, Paul, I, I, I'm curious, how do you develop a, a personal walk with Christ? I think he would look at you and go, what are you talking about? I'm looking for a church that meets my needs. Paul would go, what are you talking about? These are people whose very lives depended on one another. They could not survive without each other. And can I just brag on our church family for a moment? I think we're starting to get it. You know, when somebody gets sick at the Highland Oaks Church, we rally around that sick family. When somebody's house burns down, when somebody loses a job, we rally around that family, we give funds to that family. When somebody has a milestone, like a wedding, or when somebody experiences the tragic loss of a family member, this family shows up. Do you know why? Because that's what family does. I've heard it over and over and over again. If I'm by a hospital bed or if I'm at someone's house, it always, always happens. Pat, I don't know how people do this without a church family. Amen? You can't do this on your own. It's not possible. We need each other. Our survival depends on it. And I know it's difficult to find a place of belonging. I know it's hard when we live in a menu culture to walk into here and expect, well, man, I've got to give that person this and that person this. I would like to strongly argue that you can't do this alone. Because if you do, your spiritual life is at stake. And I think God loves us too much to just step back and say, just go ahead and try it on your own. It's fine. Because conversion to Christ must lead to a community of Christ. N.T. Wright says this about Acts chapter 2. If you've ever at a place where you find the church unattractive, unresponsive, distant, or dull. Go back to Acts chapter 2, get on your knees and read it over and over and over again and ask yourself, what isn't happening that ought to be happening? That's the question I want to ask. What isn't happening that ought to be happening? We have to be about sharing life together. That's what our conversion calls us to. Where we belong to one another, we give to one another, we survive because of each other. So, get out your handout. As promised, every week we're not just going to talk about what we value, we're going to imagine ways to practice what we value. I don't know if you've ever thought about it in this way, but if you want to be a disciple... Come to the assembly in order to be inspired. I meet few people that walk away from an assembly like ours uninspired. Now there may be different parts that connect with you in different ways, but hopefully at some point you're going to come to an assembly to be inspired. But if you want to be inspired and learn, I think you've got to go to a deeper level, which is to connect with a class. And this is not a guilt trip for some of you that don't come to class because some of you have some good reasons, but it is a guilt trip for some of you that don't think class is important. I think it's very important because if the disciples were devoted to teaching, I think we ought to be devoted to teaching too. 
And maybe that doesn't happen in a class here at Highland Oaks. Maybe that happens in a Bible study. Maybe that happens in the women's Bible study. Maybe that happens in some Bible study. But whatever you're doing, we need to connect with a class, a smaller group of people in order to learn. But then out of this class comes a commitment to a life group. This is where I think the chair of becoming is, can be really strong here at this church. A life group is a small group of disciples who commit to sharing life together. Some of you call it home team. Some of you call it small groups. I'm going to call it life group. The reason is because of this definition. It's a small group of disciples who commit to sharing life together. On the back of this page, you've got something called life group advocates. A lot of churches have small group ministers on staff. We don't have one of those. You know what we have? You. I'm looking at you. And we want to help equip you, us, to live life together and commit to sharing life together. So I've drafted some life group advocates. These are couples from all kinds of different generational backgrounds that want to tell the story of why their life group works. Because there's no life group that ought to look exactly the same as another. Do you know why? Because we're a family. Does your family look exactly the same as another? Shake your this way. It'll go faster. It doesn't. We're all different. We all have different needs. I think about Kyle and Taylor Westbrook. Uh, their class does life together twice a week in someone's home. And I love this because some of them have babies, some of them don't, but it doesn't matter. But they love being together and they're walking through a video series right now and having conversation around that video series. That's one way a life group can work. I, I love Trey and Marla Finley's life group. There's no Bible study attached to it. They simply get together twice a month with their life group and they eat. Doesn't that sound good? But they eat because there's really no agenda attached to eating other than sharing life together, sharing stories, walking alongside of the hurts and pains of parenting and life. I like James and Juan L. Teague's story as well meeting with a group of people, and sometimes they process my sermon. Imagine that. And where's my friend Roger Edwards? Right down here up front. I owe Roger a big thank you because Roger, ever since he and his wife Carolyn have walked into this church family, have been prodding and pushing life groups. Do you know why? Because Roger understands that belonging to Christ involves belonging to one another. So Roger emails me every week and he says, Pat, I need sermon questions for my life group so that we can process what your sermon is trying to invite us to do. And I don't hear that as, man, Pat, you're the greatest thing ever, but rather we want to process what this church is trying to understand. That's one way a life group works. And you, I, I could go through several stories, but these are life group advocates that want to share their story of how it works. So if you're not in a life group, contact one of these advocates and let them tell you the story. And then what they're going to do is they're going to send your names to us at the office and we want to contact you and maybe try to put you in a context where you can meet some other people that may have some common interest as you so you can commit to doing life together. Now, let me also say this. Some of you are sharing life together, and you don't call it a life group. And I want to invite you to call it a life group. For example, I know some of you have been living life together at this church family for 20, 30, 40 years. And you get together once a month, every other month. You know what that is? That's a life group. Do you know why? Because you can't imagine walking through life without one another. That's a life group. This doesn't have to be programmed. But we want to be helpful. If you want to walk through some questions, we've got them. If you want us to point you to media, we've got them. But our encouragement is this. We have to become a church that gets smaller as we get larger. We have to move from attendance to intendance. How do we intend to be together? I'll close with this story as we move to the table. In a few moments, we're going to participate in a celebration 
that was instituted by Jesus, some of your heart rates went up as soon as you walked into the room and it was face palm, great, trays are on the tables again. Can I just tell you that's okay with me? It's okay to walk in and not like something. It's all right. But what we're asking you to do is to participate in a way that I think models what Acts chapter 2 is trying to do right. Let me tell you why. John York, my preaching professor, told a story when he preached on Philippians here that has stuck with me for several months. It's the story of a, of a man that suffered a heart attack at a restaurant and nobody knew what to do, but there was one person there that could do CPR. And the person came and began doing chest compressions, but the ambulance was stuck in traffic. And so as people began to become aware of what was going on, another person that knew CPR took over. And then another person took over. And then another person took over. 26 people kept this person alive for 96 minutes. Some 4,800 chest compressions. Miraculously, the guy survived. They're interviewing him on the news, and they ask him, what's it like to know that you were dead and now you've got another day to live? And he said, I don't wake up a single morning without thinking that I am only alive because several people wouldn't let me die. Who's not going to let you die? Who's doing your chest compressions? Jesus thought it was important enough to draft 12 people. I think it ought to be important to us. And even when Jesus was about to die, he asked three to come with him. Who are you sharing life with? What has the brokenness of Jesus and the blood of Jesus done to draw you into relationship with someone else? The invitation is for you to come in just a moment and share the bread and the cup with those that you are choosing to do life with. And as you embrace, as you share, as you talk, may we be reminded we cannot do this alone. And we can't wake up any day of the week without thinking there are lots of people at the Highland Oaks Church that won't let me die. Oh God, we take this bread, we take this wine with a deep sense of gratitude, not only for you, but the way you draw us into relationship with one another. God, there are people that are hearing the sound of my voice right now who aren't committed to to a life group. They don't even, they don't even know if they, they, they fit. And God, I just want to just pray for them specifically that they would find someone here at this church that can be family to them. And God, for those of us that are committed to one another, may that commitment deepen as we learn how to survive together. We don't want to be an Acts 2 church. We want to be a Jesus-led church that uses Acts 2 as a model where we can all be together, share with one another, give to one another so that you, O oh God, can add to our number as we are becoming, as we are being saved. Give us a deep sense of awareness as we come to the table. In Jesus' name, amen. Won't you come?